Well, thank you very much, and it's a pleasure to be with uh, Secretary Mnuchin. Steven is somebody I knew as my boss when I used to run the Inter-American Development Bank. But uh, not only as we just heard, he was the 77th uh, Secretary of the Treasury. Uh, Wikipedia calls him. He was the most effective member of President Trump's uh, uh, cabinet and the one that whose judgment was never dismissed. Uh, and that's, as you all know, not a small feat. Uh, he has a huge career in, in finance uh, from Goldman Sachs, working in hedge funds as a film director and an and investor. And as you heard recently uh, in a new fund that he's uh, created. Let's begin with a question that as I was going in, everybody asked me to ask you. I mean, this macro picture we're in, I mean, you, you, you came to the Treasury, did an amazing tax reform, got the economy back growing, and here we are. Well, I think it's not a surprise where we are, and I've been saying this for the last year. Uh, COVID was a very unique situation. It needed to have a fiscal and monetary response. You know, as I said before, I was really proud of we passed bipartisan bills 96 to zero and 100 to zero. The, the, the first over two trillion we spent, we needed. The second 800 billion we needed. I think if we hadn't have done that, we would have had a global depression, not recession. We then did another trillion, which in hindsight we shouldn't have done, and the ongoing spending should have stopped. So it, it's not a surprise. We have inflation. There's been too much fiscal response. Um, you know, I think the Fed and a lot of economists just missed it. And as a result, we're now in a situation where interest rates have gone up a lot. And I think the Fed will get interest rates under, con inflation under control. I mean, for a long time, the Fed couldn't get to 2%. They changed the policy and said they'd run slightly hot when they were slightly cold. So, you know, I, I think kind of they'll get it to three, maybe not two, but it's going to take into, into next year. And I think the, the Fed should be close to done because these interest rates are slowing the economy. Steven, when you look at from your vantage point what happened both in uh, Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Valley Bank, number one, could, could it have been prevented? Was it a failure of regulation? How do you I mean, from all that you've seen, what, what would be the lessons learned here? And more importantly, how do you see the coordination between the Fed, the Treasury, and the FDIC? And, and you know, there's a lot of talk about should the guarantee stay where it is or increase? Well, look, un unlike the last financial crisis, which was about credit, which is a, a much more complicated issue to work through, this banking crisis is all about interest rate risk. And, and this is simple basic risk management 101. A anybody who's managing a bank should be looking at their assets and their liabilities. And, you know, I think this was a complete failure on management, and it was also a failure on the regulators. We don't need new legislation. The, the, the basic issue that, you know, they took all of these big deposits and invested them in long-term treasuries and had a gigantic mismatch where, again, they own treasury and mortgage-backed securities. This should have been seen way in advance, and uh, it should never have occurred. Stephen, do you, do you think that coming out of, of all of this, normally there is a tendency to over-regulate? And do you see that? Where would you see you know, this regulation going? And more importantly, something that you observed while you were secretary on the regional banks which provide close to 50% of the lending of the United States. Hey, look, I've, I've always believed that regional banks and community banks are really important. We can't just have three or four money center banks in the US. These are the banks that drive so much of the economy. Um, you know, again, we passed bipartisan legislation on banking reform. I know there's a lot of discussions now that that was the cause. I think that's ridiculous. Again, I go back to, you know, it should be that the regulators require banks over $100 billion to do stress tests on interest rates. Now, the more complicated issue we have, and again, I think it's, it's pretty straightforward. If, if you took a $3 billion uninsured deposit from one person, like, like you, you better have that in T-bills or you better have that at the Federal Reserve for instant liquidity. Now the question is, what do we do with FDIC insurance? 
So the problem is the government now guaranteed all of these depositors. We don't know if there's another bank failure, whether the government will or won't guarantee all the depositors. And you know, you could be a well-run mid-size or regional bank today, and you're at a complete disadvantage because people are moving money to the, to the money center bank. So I, I think we need bipartisan legislation. We should raise the FDIC insurance to either 10 million or 25 million. Something that's legitimate, that small businesses that have operating accounts can have their money safe, people can have their money safe. We shouldn't have unlimited insurance, but we, we now need clarity because it's unfair that, uh, and if we don't do this, you know, we're going to see that the regional banks and, commer and, and, and community banks ha have just a complete disadvantage. How do you see, you know, every time that the Fed picks up rates the way we've seen, if you look back in history in the last 50 or 60 years, something breaks in the system. The history was, I mean, coming from Latin America, really in a period of 25 years, we had almost like 25 financial crises. And we learned a lot of these lessons in dealing with inflation. But how do you see, you know, the, the other tail risk effects going forward from what we are seeing right now in other parts of the world? I mean, the, the problem is most of the people we have in the financial markets in the U.S. have never seen, quote, high interest rates. You know, when, when I started at Goldman Sachs in the beginning of my career, the 30-year the treasury was at nine and a quarter. And I remember when it went down to seven and a quarter, people like, that's, that's really low. And, you know, mortgage rates were around 10% at the time. Most people have been used to interest short-term interest rates between zero and 2%. So, you know, 4%, 5% is high on a relative basis. And look, the economy is going to adjust pretty significantly. But as, I, as I've said earlier, this is risk management 101 that a lot of people just got used to, oh, we're going to have low interest rates forever. Talk a little bit about an area that you know a lot and you worked a lot on, which is China. One of the interesting things to watch is how China, for instance, in the last two years has stopped buying close to $250 billion of U.S. treasuries. How do you see the relationship with China evolving? How do you see the need to at least have some kind of communication that is better? Overall, when you, where you sit where you're at, thinking back of what you were seeing and going forward, how do you see that relationship evolving and, of course, the, in, the implications that it has for the rest of the sure. world? Sure. Well, let me comment on China and then let's come back and talk about okay. government funding as well, which is an important issue. Look, uh, on the China issue, um, this is the second largest economy in the world. We have a responsibility to figure out how we deal with China in a proactive way. And I think kind of during our administration, we always said on the economic side, China had, the U.S. was completely open and it wasn't fair and reciprocal. And that's really about everything that we were doing. You know, at the end, we started shifting to the national security issues. You know, uh, I, I actually dealt with the TikTok issue, and President Trump signed the CFIUS issue on TikTok, which has been sitting around for the last few years. Um, there are legitimate national security issues. There are legitimate things that we should not be doing with China, but there's a whole bunch of things that we should be doing with China, and, and we need to figure out how to coexist in the proper way. I'd also say, look, you know, a lot of people look at China as a big threat. Um, I think it's a threat. I think it's an opportunity. One of the things people don't really focus on is the population of China is going to shrink by hundreds of millions of people, and the population of India is going to grow by hundreds of millions of people. So, you know, over the next 10 years, we're also going to see that dynamic. It's going to be very expensive for China as the population ages and shrinks. There's no question. It's probably one of the countries in the world that is going to shrink the fastest. Talk about the financing of the U.S. government in this current environment, higher interest rates, that pulling out of China. How do you see the U.S. government financing towards the future? Well, look, I, I, th I think the financing, you know, the size of the deficits and the size of the U.S. debt is an issue, and it's an issue that has to be dealt with on a bipartisan basis. You know, I, I never thought we'd kind of normalize trillion dollar spending. Um, you know, the Democrats are now saying, oh, they want a clean debt ceiling. I mean, the reality of it is 
the last debt ceiling we did, which was a two-year deal, Speaker Pelosi and I negotiated nonstop around the clock, and her condition of raising the debt ceiling was that we agree on two years of spending, and Congress passed a bill which the President signed that was a two-year spending deal, raising the caps with a two-year debt ceiling. And it was really important to us to raise the debt ceiling and get that for two years. There's things we had to compromise on. In those days, we were like 10 or $15 billion apart. I mean, it's, it's pretty incredible. We're now negotiating in trillions and not billions. But I, I, I do think Speaker McCarthy and President Biden need to sit down and negotiate. We obviously can't let the U.S. default. But you know, again, this is something that needs bipartisan support. And, and, and I do agree, spending has to be part of the discussion. We need to have the economy grow faster than the government spending. This, there's so many other things I would love to ask you, but I know we're short of time. But quick, uh, short or long on the dollar? So now that I'm out of government, I can comment on the dollar. When I was Treasury Secretary, it was one of these things, if you made the slightest hint and like <laughs> sneezed, the market goes crazy. Um, you know, look, uh, it, it's kind of been common for a Treasury Act to always say, strong dollar, strong dollar. When, when I was in government, you know, there's aspects of the strong dollar that, that have benefits and in, in not such great things. But, but as an investor, I'd keep all my money in dollars. Um, I think there'll be a, with everything going on in the world, the U.S. will grow faster than the rest, and I think the dollar does better. How about the euro? Well, the euro versus the dollar will underperform. How about crypto? Crypto, uh, great technology, very interesting, particularly for payments and things like that. Uh, I, I, I'm not a big believer in buying it as an asset class, but I like the technology. One last question on emerging markets. Short or long? Short. All right. Well, thank you very much, Secretary Manucci. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you.